Microphone set. We're at 92% on the camera. I got a nice full glass of beer. I think we're ready to go. Hey guys, and welcome to episode seven of Scientific Drinking. Tonight, we're talking about SpaceX and Blue Origin and what those two competitors mean to the space industry now and in the near future. Cheers. So tonight I'm drinking uh, St. Bernardist Abbey Christmas Ale right here. This was left behind by my former roommate, Danny, and he gave it to me as a parting gift as he moved on. He had an internship here at NASA and stayed with me. He was a great house guest. He was a little bit, uh, a little bit salty. He never got on one of my videos, so sorry, buddy, but you know. You're not as pretty as me. All right, so first let's get a short recap of the news. Starliner has been mounted to its rocket, rolled out to the pad and tested, and it's just about ready for launch. In fact, by the time I post this video, it should have already launched, pending some issue with the weather or any unforeseeable situation. In other news, the SLS core stage has been completed, which is a huge hurdle. If you watch my SLS episode here, then you'll know that uh, getting SLS up and running has been a bit of a challenge. I read in the news that perhaps it's by June 2020. That's not something I work on, uh, but if that's getting off the ground as soon as June 2020, hey, that's good news. I can't wait to see that launch. Imagine the rumble. Whew. And the next piece of news, Starship, which I talked about last episode, is moving on to its Mark II and Mark III phases, which means they're terminating construction of the competition version that they had going on here in Florida. As you may have known, they had two simultaneous builds going on in Boca Chica, Texas, and here in Cocoa, Florida. The one here in Cocoa, Florida has just been abandoned. It's just sitting there, uh, but no one's lost their jobs. Everyone there at SpaceX has been reassigned to other missions, perhaps getting Starlink up and running. And the Starlink launches are kicking into high gear. We're getting launches at least twice a month for several months. Uh, and so the skies will be filled with a rumble of nine Falcon engines for quite a while. All right, and on to our main topic. Uh, so we're gonna talk about SpaceX and Blue Origin and what the nature of their competition really is and what it means to the space industry. Everyone's very familiar with SpaceX. They're in the news all the time. Blue Origin, not so much. You get a little bit here and there, you know, with their Blue Moon project and uh, a little bit of hype with their new Glenn, but we're gonna talk a little bit about why that's interesting in itself. So SpaceX was founded in 2002. It has a grand total of 7,000 employees spread out across various bases, mostly in California, Texas, and here in Florida. 7,000 is a lot of employees, and they have about 12 billion in contract from the government to launch rockets, such as the Commercial Resupply Service and various satellites. In addition to that, they have a lot of launches that they do for commercial satellites and geostationary satellites, such as Arabsat, which was the first commercial satellite to be launched on the Falcon Heavy earlier this year. Despite all of this, SpaceX is still not profitable. They have a long-term vision going, but that margin of non-profitability is rapidly closing and soon I foresee SpaceX as being a profitable enterprise. And by soon, I mean within 10 years. We're not talking about, you know, in a couple months. Space industry usually doesn't move that fast. Speaking of moving fast, SpaceX has applied to be a competitor for various aspects of the Artemis mission. Now I talked about Artemis in yet another video. And so if you're interested in knowing more about what Artemis is and how it works, check that one out. Now the way they are competing with Artemis is for the commercial resupply service to deliver supplies to the moon and potentially competing for components of Gateway and indeed perhaps commercial resupply services directly to the moon itself using Starship, which would be a huge challenge. I talked more about some of the issues with Starship and landing on the moon in last episode, including lunar dust and complexity among other things. Now what I haven't talked about yet in any significant detail is Blue Origin and they're worth talking about by themselves for many reasons but it's difficult to do an entire episode on one of the rockets because well really they haven't done a lot with their rockets yet. A little bit of background on Blue Origin they were founded in 2000. Now that's before SpaceX probably not a lot of people know that because they've been flying under the radar for such a long time and that's not the only surprising thing about Blue Origin. They have 2,500 employees which is less than half of that of SpaceX but they are growing fast. Uh, in fact they are at capacity with their Washington location and they're expanding that as quickly as they can, bring in new, new people all the time. In fact, one of my good friends just got hired to work up there in their Washington site during the new wave of expansion. Kenton, congratulations, buddy, good job. Now, in contrast to SpaceX, Blue Origin is getting about 500 million from 2019 to 2024. Now that's 1 24th of what SpaceX gets in contracts. Now that's 2019 to 2024 for something that's not even working yet. 
So there's a certain amount of confidence that the government has placed that they can get this up and running. All right, so what does the future look like going forward for SpaceX and Blue Origin? Well, it's a bright future. We already know the launch market is growing very rapidly. Uh, but it's going to be very interesting to look at the dynamism between these two competitors. Blue Origin, as I already stated, has the capability to sit back and watch as SpaceX may or may not stumble with Starship's development. And because of their reserves and capital, they can put the price point for New Glenn at pretty much whatever they want. It's not like Amazon's going to go out of business anytime soon, knock on wood. Oh, that's a shame. Well, it's a good thing I have a backup, right? You guys didn't think I only drank beer, did you? So one thing I forgot to mention is their employees. Now, SpaceX has been known to push their employees to the limit. And that's really good if you're working in an environment that you thrive in. And not a lot of people can thrive in an environment which demands you to work 80 hours a week. And granted, not everyone at SpaceX has these extremely demanding work schedules, but SpaceX demands 110% of their employees, which can be challenging day in and day out. So the turnover rate at SpaceX tends to be pretty high. We're talking about a few years at most. The average age at SpaceX is pretty low relative to other aerospace companies. Now that by itself is not an inhibiting factor because you have to keep in mind that during the Apollo era, the average age at NASA itself was only 26 and we built rockets that went to the moon. So it's possible to operate successfully with a lower average age. So obviously it is, they're getting rockets off the ground all the time, right? Now compare that to Blue Origin. Blue Origin's pensive approach to business and building rockets is reflected in the people that they hire, which tend to stick around for a longer time, get paid a generous salary, and work in a very incremental, pensive, and deliberate way, as opposed to SpaceX's haphazard, build it, launch it, let's see what happens. Kisser. For better or for worse, these strategies build into the companies themselves and work towards the future that they intend to build. In conclusion, and my personal perspective, is that in the long term, Blue Origin has a capability to come out ahead in the competition between them and SpaceX. SpaceX, although already having an avid following, might not have the market reserves to compete with their strategically positioned Blue Origin in the near future especially if their new Glenn comes to fruition as the super reliable and capable super heavy lift vehicle that it is poised to be. While the complexity of Starship may hinder its development to the point that it may be eliminated from the competition of the super heavy lift market, let's reflect on this last thought. If you're gonna go to Mars, are you gonna wanna go to Mars on a rocket that has been built and tested a million times to make sure that they have worked out every defect, especially when you're gonna spend nine months in this thing? Or are you gonna go to Mars on a rocket that's been built, tested, and flown with a sense of urgency, but perhaps at the cost of safety? You tell me. Now, this is my own personal opinion, and I would love to hear your feedback and what you think. Is it gonna be Blue Origin or is it gonna be SpaceX that comes out ahead in this competition of commercial payload services to deeper space destinations? Thanks for watching. Tune in next time when we talk about the differences between Orion and the Apollo era capsules. What makes them so different? Why is Orion so revolutionary? Well, we'll find out. Cheers.